And the next person, I want to bring up D. Daniel B. Blaze. I don't know. <laughs> That's a new one right there. Introduce. Uh, Daniel Blaze, you know him as DB or uh, Laney's dad. Um, he's bringing the word today, and it's one of the things in our community. I know we have a lot of newish people. Uh, we firmly believe that other people, other than the lead pastor or the primary teacher, has a gifting. And so uh, two really good encouragements and reminders for you is that you're better in your life following Jesus if you follow other people as they follow Jesus. If you just listen to one preacher the rest of your life, you'll become more like them. DB's life experience is different than mine. His passion is different. What he's going to say is different than how I would say it. And secondly, this is a great opportunity to develop other people with similar spiritual gifts in the way that they're doing it. And so it's not something we're doing because we just need a break or something like that. It's actually best for you. I'm convinced of that. A couple things you need to know about DB. Um, he's ridiculously fit. It's not true at all. <laughs> I've done burpees with him, and he does them three times faster than me. And you I consider myself... Ever. I know, I won't, because I think... You, you, I, did, I tried to do 15, and I'd done five, and he had already done 15. And I was like, it's impossible. Um, this was but, four, four years ago. This was yeah, four years so ago. Yeah, no, so who knows what you can do now? Like right. five times faster. You want to try it? We'll do yeah. some? Okay. Um, but more seriously, though, this is true. He is fit. Um, a couple words that I would use to describe him, and you'll see it. Uh, one is passion. If you're his friend, if you have seen him at work, if you're a part of his family, or if you're a part of this church, he's passionate about the things he invests in. He has been studying for this for two months. I told him not to start that early because I knew how much he would want to dig in, and he's done that. And he's also so, uh, the, the word perseverance, of if you know his story and the things even in the last few years, but uh, with his family and with his upbringing and different things like that, he perseveres and continues to follow the Lord and be obedient in the face of things that many of us uh, would, would potentially step away from. And I'm confident that he's going to bring a great word today. Um, and I want to pray for him before he jumps up here. And so would you extend a hand as part of our community and pray over him as we do this? God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for the word that you've put in DB's heart and how you're going to speak through him. Pray that you would give us listening ears and soft hearts that you can mold. Thank you for him. Give him confidence and courage and also just the humility that you chose to speak through him today. We commit this time to you, and we ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dad. All right, everybody stand up. Here we go. I need everybody to stand up real quick. I am a coach by profession, so this helps. Uh, I'm going, this is actually, there's some of my players in the room, so this is so that they don't fall asleep. And trust me, guys, if you do fall asleep, we will do suicides right after we leave here. Uh, I'm going to say something, and I need you guys to repeat something back. So I'm going to say, God is at work, and you are going to repeat back saying, and so am I. So right here we go. Three, two, one. God is at work. God is at work. Okay, so why am I doing that? I would have to believe right now, uh, all of us have some type of circumstance, relationship issue, um, tough moment, where we are just looking for God to step in and work. Here's the reality. He's always working. Uh, it doesn't matter the circumstance. He's continually working. There's moments actually right now where God is asking us to remind ourselves that we have a part to play in this. There, there's going to be moments in life where we are just looking so hard for him to change something or do something or say something, and that's the moment where we have to take ownership and do something as well. So if you would pray for me, God, or pray with me, God, I thank you so much for this opportunity again uh, to just be here at a place that I call home. I thank you for your word. I thank you for um, these people in this room, and I pray right now that uh, my words would not be heard, uh, that this would point back to ultimately you and who you are, who you've always been. We love you, Lord. We trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. Good morning. Hello. Hello, 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 everyone. Uh, my name, yes, my name is Daniel Blaze. Um, we have been here at now 704 Church for four and a half years. Um, I work at Charlotte Christian School in their athletic department. I coach basketball for them. Uh, before I get going, I would love to show my better half. This is my family. Uh, this is my beautiful wife, Dana, who is way out of my league that I don't deserve at all. Uh, I, I promise I, I believe that. Uh, this is Luca. She's nine. Uh, sh this is Lainey over here. She's going on four. 
This is Levi. Uh, he's going on two, and the cat's out of the bag. We are pregnant. Um, the, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the Lord, I guess, did say be fruitful and multiply, and I'm praying that multiplication also includes our finances. Uh, that would be great. Uh, it's funny. I'm actually speaking today, and it says, you know, blessed are you who are poor, and yours is the kingdom of heaven. I'm like, great. <laughs> I'm getting some great rewards in heaven. Uh, so, no, uh, a year ago, uh, again, we've been at this church for four and a half years. Um, a year ago, I, I preached for the first time, um, and it's a really humbling, humbling thing to stand up here. Um, it, but it also at the same point, I, I appreciate our leadership that does empower their body to stand up and get out of their comfort zone. So I don't take this moment lightly. I don't take this morning lightly. Uh, I did do a lot of preparation, even though, I mean, that's just how I am in general. Um, but the biggest goal I had was to hopefully give um, brothers and sisters, all of us alike, just a word that was given to me um, that I've just been preparing for. Um, so what are we doing? Where are we going? Um, in the last month, we've been in a series of Luke. So we've heard many different people speak on Luke, Wayne, Pastor Thad. Um, we took a kind of a break when we went to Easter. We went to Matthew. Obviously, we wanted to really celebrate the Easter celebration. Uh, so now we are going to go back to Luke. Um, again, some things just as a refresher, we've talked about Jesus' authority. Uh, we've talked about intimacy and grace and the passage of Luke, the early passage, and then the accounts of the disciples. So now we're going to head into Luke 6, which is about blessings and woes. There's four blessings, there's four woes in the midst of Jesus' ministry. Um, and there, there's really a lot of mixed messages here with very uh, deep spiritual meanings, which is like every sermon, I guess. But anyway, I, I'm trying to get at, there's a lot packed in this verse. So stay with me throughout the course of when we read, okay? Um, ultimately, the biggest goal is God's going to break down his view of Christianity for his disciples. And that's kind of where I'm going to really, really uh, key in on, looking at what he was speaking directly to his disciples after he just handpicked them and kind of refocus and flip things upside down right, of where the times were at, of how people viewed Christianity, but where God really wanted to land on this is Christianity and where it starts. Um, so uh, for those who are new, we do this thing, and it, it's fun. It's just an opportunity to remind us that we read from the book of God. So uh, we do this thing on the count of three. We say, bring out the book, and I'm going to make sure we do that right now. So one, two, three. Bring out the book. All right, so here we go. So we are in Luke chapter 6, 7, through 26. This is what's titled the Sermon on the Plain. I think it's going to be up on the screen as well. So here we go. If you don't have your Bibles, uh, use your phone. Try not to text guys, just like in class. Sorry. Uh, okay, so he went down with them and stood on a level place. All right, stop. I, I, I have actually been wrestling with this all, all month, and it is not a part of my notes. God is not a God that sits in that back row and is pointing down at me right now saying, look at everything my son or daughter does or doesn't do. I just don't believe that's him. I don't believe it. And even in, as we dive into this, I mean, look at the nature of God. He went down with them and stood on level place. I mean, guys, like, look at your lives, right? And just trust that the Lord is leveling with you. He's not going to, he's not a, a big kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass. He is loving. He's caring. And this has been really striking me even in the beginning to set up this passage. He went down with them to get on their level. So I just thought that was a big thing. Let's keep reading. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. And people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. 
Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is the word of God. So obviously, there is a lot there. There is monuments of things and angles and paths we can go on. Uh, but here are just three points. Uh, the whole thing that, again, I love is that we all, like that said, we, we see Scripture differently, we interpret it differently, but hopefully it points back to the same thing, which is Jesus and truth, right? Three key points just to think about before I get into it. Um, again, we're looking at Jesus' ministry, his time on the earth, when he started to do, uh, it, really in the Gospels, when he started to do ministries, um, all types of signs and wonders. Right in the beginning, he, everybody's on level playing field. So even though there was masses of different people there, disciples, children, men, women, all different types, everybody was equal in that moment in Jesus' eyes, okay? Second point, reminder, Jesus came to the earth to save the lives of sinners, right, and strengthen the lives of the followers. And where does he start with that? I'm going to touch on this word identity. Where is your identity? And then third thing, um, a bulk of the message is on blessings and woes, right? And there's a connection between the two to teach and equip. So don't get ahead of it. Don't get ahead of reading the text and then, you know, letting your mind wander. Uh, there's an external part that is, we're talking about, but there's an internal meaning that we really want to get on. So here we go. This is the best way that I learned. So I'm just going to go verse by verse and we're going to get after it. Okay, here we go. So verse 17, he went down with them and stood on level place. Obviously, I kind of went off on a little bit, but um, as I was doing research, uh, there's a, a big correlation between the Beatitudes of Matthew. Yeah. So um, I really, I, I talked to Thad about this. I, I really wasn't going that way. So I listened to a couple sermons on the same passage. I read some commentaries. I didn't want to go towards the Beatitudes. That wasn't really where, like, to compare and contrast. Um, they're really the same in the nature of um, the, same the same message, but a different perspective. Um, but to really kind of give you an idea, if we were to kind of look at the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, there's in the Beatitudes, a spiritual and a physical reality being described. Um, it's important to recognize that, but not to make it one for one. Being poor physically can lead to being poor in spirit, but that is not always the case. And being rich physically does not exclude someone from being poor in spirit. So Matthew's record seems to emphasize the spiritual reality, while Luke's emphasizing the physical, like the physical aspects of what he said in those four blessings, poor, hungry now, weeping now. Um, Luke also adds the woes in contrast, and I think this is really to hope maybe to believe that he was trying to, to shake up the view of Christians and who's a Christian in that time. And again, I'll touch on that later. So verse 18 and 19, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases, all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. So people came for two reasons, right? They, heal, they came to be healed, cured of diseases and sickness, and to hear Jesus speak. So there's an aspect of faith right away from all the people, right? The people came to hear him, to be cured of diseases, healed of sickness. Don't you wish we could just go back to that? And when I speak to anything, when I share stories, like I, internally what's going on is I know I'm speaking directly to myself first. And these are things I struggle with, right? But at the same time, like they came for the simplicity of their faith that Jesus was going to do something. So when I have a headache or when I am hurt, I want to get what? Ibuprofen. I want to get medicine. But for them, they said, no, my child is sick. We're going to go straight to Jesus. They are, there was a faith that was already rising up to go listen to this man speak and, and be cured and be freed. Uh, so I, I just think that's huge already to set the tone. There was a faith. Again, looking ahead, uh, it makes me think about in Luke 8, um, the woman who bled for many years. And she said, I just need to touch his garment. And I know that I would be healed. I just needed just, just a touch of his garment, right? So think of that in this context as we move forward, just the faith of the people, okay? So um, verse 20, verse A, looking at his disciples. So this is where I really wanted to lean on for the rest of the time. So he just picked his hand, he just handpicked his disciples earlier in Luke 5. Um, and you got to understand, in Luke 5, there was a lot that these guys just saw. I mean, I mean, let's go through the list in Luke 5, right? Their fish were multiplied in the boat. Jesus, they saw Jesus heal a man with leprosy. 
He then forgives and heals a paralyzed man. So he's not just saying, I, I'm the great, uh, I'm most powerful, but I'm also one that's relatable. Um, and he eat, then he goes and eats with sinners. So the people that everybody would say not to go eat, Jesus says, no, I'm going to go over with them because those are my people too. Those are my brothers and sisters too. And, and then he talks about the law, Sabbath, fasting. So in a short amount of time, the disciples are, I mean, it's like drinking water from a broken fire hydrant. They are just getting just bombarded with who Jesus is as they've said yes to the call. Here's my analogy, okay? I'm a basketball guy, so this, I, I'm sorry for those who aren't basketball people, but I think we could pick up what I'm putting down. This is basically like saying you just started playing basketball a month ago, and your head coach looks at you and says, all right, get ready. You got to go play defense on LeBron James, make sure Shaquille O'Neal doesn't dunk the ball over your head, stop Michael Jordan from scoring. Oh, and by the way, you have to score 30 points. It's physically impossible. Like you just can't do it, right? But I think if you look at the perspective that I'm trying to, the, the, the image here, he, Jesus is trying to get the disciples the most prepared for what's to come, for what they're about to do, right? If you skip down to John 14 and, tw uh, and 12, um, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. So how I was interpreting this portion, this next part, when he's looking at his disciples, he's getting them ready for the journey. When we say yes to Jesus, I mean, there's a long journey ahead of you. There's a long journey ahead of us of faithfulness, of stepping out. But I think Jesus was just trying to get them the most prepared because the journey, as we know, it's hard. It's a hard journey, right? So let's keep going. Um, again, four points I kind of thought about. Uh, Jesus was challenging, empowering, encouraging, preparing all in one. He was challenging the people around by performing uh, many different miracles, signs, wonders, ki uh, curing diseases and, and sickness. He was speaking to them. He was empowering and encouraging his disciples, right? So he's trying to get them as breast prepared, and he's about to get in this with the four blessings and the four woes. Ultimately, what I believe, preparing them. Everything is for preparation, um, and now when we move forward, we're going to look at this preparation using external things that point back to internal being, okay? So how are we doing? Is everybody okay? I know I'm kind of going fast, but I'll slow down. Just raise your hand or something. I don't know. Uh, so again, last thing, you know, Luke, as we look at forward, Luke 9, 1 through 2, and this is, again, I, I'm trying to connect the dots. He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So I'm jumping ahead. This is what the disciples, us, we are about to go do. This is what we are, they are getting ready to go do, right? So in this portion, he's preparing, he's encouraging, he's challenging. Um, he's bringing all this under the context of, of what he's about to say. There's external things or of your being that ultimately are not the focus for me. It's about what's going on internally, okay? So verse 20b, blessed are you who are poor, amen, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, okay, so the word blessed comes from the Greek word happy or joyful with sincere comfort that is untouchable. The connection right now is really striking to me, okay? Blessed are you who are poor. So if you think about a poor man, right, there's actually wisdom that they have. And this is what it is. There's wisdom in the fact that he knows he needs somebody to fill his need. There's nothing he has. He needs somebody to fulfill something of need, a physical need. He doesn't fantasize about fulfilling his needs and means that are outside of his control. He needs people, person, to guide him. Okay? So can't we all connect to someone being poor, specifically within a spiritual context? We being poor in spirit need to be filled, and that's through one person. That's Jesus. It's, he's, it's only Jesus that can fill us, right? So there's already, like, again, external being poor, but there's wisdom in a poor man that he knows he needs someone to fill him. Psalm 107, 8 through 9, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Watch the setup here. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. So that's the setup, okay? We are to be like one who is poor all the time. We cannot do this life on our own strength and in our own way. Every day we need Jesus to equip, strengthen, and fill us up with wisdom and understanding. Okay, so again, first blessing, 
being poor physically. We need someone to fill us up, okay? Verse 21a, our next verse. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Okay, this, again, another physical attribute, being hungry, right? Uh, someone who is in need of food, their focus and pursuit is what? To go get food, to fill them up. They're starving. There's a craving. It drives them. Um, so again, another connection Jesus is making is to his disciples. Again, mind you, he's looking at his disciples now, right? To be hungry is to, you have to have food to fill you up. Well, there was one commentary that connected this hunger for food is like passion for righteousness. And these are some things. So by, a, a commentary by Enduring Word. Passion for righteousness is real, just like hunger is real. Passion for righteousness is natural, just like hunger is natural to a healthy person. Passion for righteousness is intense, just like being hungry is intense. I mean, y'all, when I'm hangry and my eldest are hangry, I mean, we are intense people. I mean, I know all of you guys are intense people when you're hungry. So anyway, uh, so passion for righteousness is painful, just like hunger can cause pain. Passion for righteousness is a driving force, just like hungry person is driven to find food. And finally, passion for righteousness is a sign of health, just like hunger shows the state of one's health. So Again, this idea of being hungry and where we are finding our food. What is filling us up? So again, two things. So going back to that, that second part, for you will be satisfied. All right, so uh, I know you asked that question about um, Sophia's mom. Uh, I would, Sophia's mom, I mean, Angie's food is great. But my mother-in-law and my wife, they make some really, really good Caribbean food, okay? So when we have food, especially pei lao. We had pei lao chicken the other night. I know there's people, if we raise our hands, when you just ate something delicious and you're filled up, I mean, your thought is you want more, right? Like you always want, oh, I just want one more plate of that, even though I know I'm full, even though I'm full. So stay with me here. I'm not thinking the negative sides of that. You're full and you want more of the right thing, Right? You're craving after more of, quote unquote, the right thing. I'm not comparing Caribbean food to Jesus. Please don't separate the two. But what I'm saying is when you grab onto the real Jesus, it just leaves you wanting more. There's always more you want from him. There's, there's, you're never going to be fully satisfied or fully fed, and nothing's ever going to replace that. You just want more and more and more, and that's actually something good. It's something good to really lean into. Um, in Psalm 22, verse 26, it says, The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All right, so verse 21b, blessed are you. This is now the third one. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. So we've been kind of talking about um, individualism, individualistic mindsets. Again, the physicalness of um, bl the blessings. Um, but now I think when I was reading through trying to prepare, it's kind of talking about individuals and the society as a whole uh, of where aspects of our sin that cause us to be in a low weeping state. Um, and we don't want to stay in this place, right? It says, for you will laugh. The low place pushes us to a place of repentance and furthermore salvation. So Sophia, she just did YWAM. Uh, it's funny, I actually did YWAM when I was 18 years old. And I wanted to kind of tell you, share this story real quick in the midst of this, uh, of how I was able to connect these dots. It, at the time when I was 18, I'm 31 now, uh, I would have not considered myself a, I, I, like really, I wouldn't have considered myself a Christian of what a true Christian is, what they stand for. Even though I came from a Christian home, um, I have two loving parents that showed me Jesus. I just wouldn't have considered that I was running away from the Lord. Externally, I had it all put together. Internally, I was a mess, an absolute mess. Again, connection, right? So I went to YWAM in Hawaii uh, to do the same kind of uh, track, DTS, Discipleship Training School. And I remember showing up, and in our first week, we shared our testimonies. And all of my friends that I met and kids my age, we had about 60, 70 people in the DTS they all just seemed like they, they just love Jesus. They just seemed like they chose to go to YOM for all the right reasons. And I remember, I mean, y'all, I lied on my application that I was even a Christian. Uh, I, I literally, I lied to all my friends at home of why I was really going. The only people that really knew why I was going were my parents and my sister. Um, and I remember getting my testimony and I was just like, dude, I have no idea why I'm here. Like I looked at my leader and this guy's like, what, why do, who brought this kid here? I mean, 
why is this guy here? So later that night, we're in our room, uh, we had seven, seven other roommates, and I was furious. I'm just like, what am I doing here? Like, I don't belong here. And what did these great men do at the time? Hey, let's pray for you. And I was like, I don't want any more prayer. Like, I don't need this. And I remember the moment where they laid their hands on me and began to pray, there was a sorrow from all the sin that I had built up inside me. And there was so much weeping that came in the next couple hours that I really felt like, you know what, it's time to get right. And it's time to, to repent. And I think that's where he was going at with this. You know, uh, blessed are you who weep now, who know that there is sin in your life, that there's things holding you down that you need to get out for you will laugh later. Again, leading us to repentance. Um, 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. So that was kind of my connection there. Uh, finally, Verse 22, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. <laughs> I mean, that's a tough one to try and break down, right? Especially for those, I don't know if there's any people in this room that aren't believers, but you're telling me you're signing up for people to hate you, to people to exclude you. I mean, let's, let's keep it real right now, right? Like Christianity is not the most appealing thing sometimes. And when you read something like this, you're just like, man, ah. Uh, you're telling me I'm blessed when people come at me and, and you know, slander me in my name and everything? I, I don't think I'm really down with that one. And again, going back to, who is he looking at? The disciples. So I thought the only thing I was really able to connect to this was preparation, preparation, preparation. We just got done with Easter and we saw what everything Jesus went through, right? How he died on the cross. I mean, we know the story. And he's looking at his disciples saying, hey, I handpicked you in preparation for something so much greater than you have any idea. You got, it's just time to take that step. Um, and really, like, what is the end goal here? What's the end goal for all of us? Well done, good and faithful servant. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy and well done, good and faithful servant. But there's preparation in the midst of the external, right? All these blessings are pointing to an external, but they really go back to the internal, Okay, so here we go. In uh, contrast to that, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. This is, again, going back to blessed are you people when they hate you. Um, rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the, the prophets. So you go through a lot to be reminded there's a reward. And the reward isn't that, oh, I get stronger or, oh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this thing. No, the reward is heaven. The reward is Jesus, point blank, period. Um, connecting the dots here, there's a commentary and they'll have it up on the screen, um, redeeming God. And it says this, the bottom line of the blessings is contentment. The true disciple of Jesus Christ has spiritual discernment and wisdom to see that even if they are physically poor, they are spiritually rich. Even if they are physically hungry, they are spiritually full. Even if they are mourning and weeping about what happens to them in this life, they can have the joy of the Lord as their strength. Even if people of this world hate them and ridicule them, they know that they have great wealth, blessings stored up for them in heaven. Uh, and we just need to remember, these blessings point back to everything that those during that time, and maybe even now, would say the opposite of. And that's what Jesus did. I mean, he flipped everything upside down, y'all. Look, when he walked on this earth, he, he messed things up in a great way, right? To point us back to something that maybe, or other people, maybe thought this was the right thing, or this was the right view, or this was the right perspective. No. Jesus is saying, let me flip this up again, and let me shake it up to show you the true meaning of who I am, the trueness of my people, the trueness of the truth, right? Okay, so here we go. Transition. We had the four blessings, external. Uh, this is where we're going to transition to the four woes. Stick with us. Again, stick with me here. Um, there's a lot. I know I'm going kind of here and there. There's a lot of different messages, uh, but don't let misconception play a role here. Uh, there's important, there really is an important lesson, okay? So verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Okay, side note. Again, when it says woe, Okay, the, 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 the inherent meaning expression that I think it was describing was to be filled with regret and compassion. So my Jesus, I'm, talking to, I'm just going to take a second and tell you about my Jesus. 
Just like I said up there, I, my Jesus is not the guy up on the top row that's pointing down at me right now saying, oh, you did that wrong. You said that wrong. Uh, you're not good over there. You still are. That's not my Jesus. My Jesus, yes, he does discipline the one he loves. And if I look back on the course of my life, he's disciplined me a lot. But uh, what I'm trying to say is he gets even with you. So when I hear woe, I don't think of woe in a downcasting way. I, I, don't, I don't see that as Jesus. I see it as, hey, I'm going to comfort you with my arm on you, and I'm going to teach you, right? Just like I'm a coach. If I'm just a coach that just disciplines, 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 but then I don't do it with love and also share the fact that like, hey, we're growing in this together. I've lost vision, right? So woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Um, so again, this aspect, this physical aspect of being rich. The physical aspect, the external aspect of being rich is there really a need externally for anything else? Is there really, and I think that's what Jesus was always maybe, maybe pointing at. There's no need for anything else externally, right? Um, being rich, uh, no sense of physical need, which normally leads to, in my opinion, and again, in my story, I would say the times where I felt like I didn't need anything, it just led to uh, more sin, more um, I was thinking for myself only, uh, there was really nothing else I would say I needed. So there was no, oh, this thought of Jesus being more in my life. No, I'm, I'm good right now. I have everything I need, right? One commentary suggested that being in continual excitement and having a good time was a genuine obstacle to the kingdom. Uh, and if we were to, you know, argue that and unpack it a little bit more, I mean, let's look at, you know, we're, I'm skipping way ahead, but we all, we talked about the prodigal son. He took a third of his inheritance to go do what? I mean, really, to party. I mean, that's what he did. He went to go have fun. He felt like he had everything he needed. And then at the end of it, he was, what, all money gone. And there was something that still wasn't filling the void. So even though externally he had the inheritance, the riches, he got to the end of it and realized, I, I'm still back at ground zero, right? Um, so again, that's kind of the first one in comparison to the first blessing. Verse 25, woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Okay, again, an external statement that Jesus is trying to connect to his disciples. Um, I brought up earlier the desire when I have good Caribbean food to want more food even though I'm full. Now here's the flip of this. Here's the negative side of this. If you are constantly just comparing, right, what other people have or what you don't have, you are never going to be fully satisfied. No, you, it doesn't matter what you eat. You are never going to get to that place of fulfillment right? You will always be hungry if that's where your heart lies, okay? So verse 25, woe to you who laugh now for you will mourn and weep. And this one was a hard one for me because I love to laugh. I always love to laugh. I love to make jokes. Um, but hear me out. Uh, one quick story. So in Ecclesiastes, it talks about when you're young, you know, be young. If that's what you do under the sun, but know there's a judgment day. Um, I think of back the story of Noah when he was building the ark. I know it doesn't really spe specify this, but I would have to imagine when this guy was building this big ark and bringing in all these animals, there were a couple of people that were like, ha, that's pretty funny. Uh, you, there's no way, you know? And they were laughing at maybe the step of faith he was taking and the calling he was taking towards the Lord. And we know the story, right? Um, so verse 26, woe to you and everyone speaks well of you. For that is how they treated the false prophets. This is an important thing to remember again. And I'm saying this in the context of all four woes. Who is considered poor? Who is considered rich? External versus internal. I keep saying it. Um, he was speaking to everybody you know at that time on a level ground. Um, and, but if you look at now our stories, right? Best athletes. Who has the highest position? Most popular. Best hair. Nicest car. Um, I'm just, I'm just li simply listening, not to say those things take you away from Jesus. I'm simply thinking of the material external things that may be covering up the internal being, right? Um, there is an expectation versus the spiritual reality of Jesus' kingdom, and we know this. Jesus told us that God does unexpected things. Here in these stories, Jesus mocked the world's values. So what, G what we even right now see as the values of the world Jesus mocks. He flips it upside down. He exalted what the world despised and rejected what the world admired. God, I think for me, th this is where, again, I, I just try and think of where am I placing all my f filling and fulfillment? 
especially even right now, right? Like I, I'll take provision, right? Even though I may not have the riches of the world, I've tried, I, I've tried in these last, like, especially year to just grind, 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 and provide, provide, provide. And that's been the thing that I feel like I've tried to fill a space where ultimately God's saying, hey, none of that is going to r- truly fill you up more than I will. So the external may be pure and the external may be, you know, in the right you know, context, but at the same time, if I'm not checking what's going on internally and really understanding that this filling inside me only can be one of Jesus, then I'm missing my point. Um, my buddy Matt, uh, who is, you know, he's a really close friend of mine. Um, he's training to be a pastor in Connecticut right now. He helped me out here, and he, he actually studied this whole passage, and um, he said this. He said, the issue is that physical blessings can often blind us to our true poverty apart from Christ. So everything that we are seeking in a physical context right? None of that matters. And we are considered poverty without Christ, right? Like that, that is what it all comes down to. Those four blessings, those four woes point back to we have nothing without Jesus. And we can have everything from the world's context, but if it's not Jesus, we truly have nothing. Um, so all right, let's circle the runway. Let's, let's land this plane. And Pat, if you want to come up, um, what was I, there was a word I mentioned before in the three points, and this is identity, how do we define ourselves? Is it by how much money we make, what our job is, our social status, how social media points us? Because we all know social media. We are all Instagram famous in our own context, right? Uh, but the, the church, um, I mean, sorry, church, J- Jesus invites us every day to die to ourselves, to pick up his cross and follow him. And as I was kind of closing and trying to figure out how I wanted to land this thing, I don't know everybody's situation in here. I don't know if people, you know, have Jesus in their heart or not. And, and if you don't, you're probably, you know, hearing all this again. It's like, dude, this is hard. You're, you're telling me I have to change up the way that I may live, the way that I may think. Um, I have to step out in ways. Uh, I have to really process through deep, deep, hard things. I mean, that's hard alone. I mean, I know there's some of us, and I do this, that just push everything down far, far, far But this is the moment where Jesus, again, looked at his disciples and saying, hey, I'm preparing you for the journey ahead. And it starts with what's going on inside. It starts with you getting right and how you view yourself, how you view me, how you view this life, how you view each other. It starts with, again, what's inside versus what we have outside. Um, The road of being a, a Christ follower, especially I know if I look over the course of my time accepting the Lord, there, there has been so many ups and downs. There's been so many moments where I've been like, man, God, I, I don't know, man. Like, this really is hard. I'm just being really, really upfront. Even this week, I mean, there, if you even knew some of the stuff that we went through this week, the devil tried everything he could to get inside me and, and have me call up fat and air and be like, I don't, think, I don't think this is the right time. But you know what? He prepared me. He prepared you. He prepares us. He prepares the disciples to do greater things than these as we say yes. But we can't take that step until we really like every day get right about what's going on internally. It doesn't, it, it, the, this world has nothing to offer us. And I know it's easy for me to say that because I'm up here, but really I'm challenging myself every single day to really invest and value what is the true Christianity, the Jesus that we all say we know. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So externally, God is going to put us through stuff. God is going to, sorry, he's going to allow us to go through things, right? To hopefully point us back to something. Not to fill our hearts and our minds with everything else externally, but to hopefully point us in the direction of him. To better equip us, to better get us ready for the journey ahead. Um, We're going to have people, we do this all the time, we're going to have people, the prayer team down below, and if you're really at this place where you, you know what, I think it's time for me to get really right with Jesus. I don't know if it's, you know, ask Jesus into your life as your personal savior, but maybe if it's just to revision, realign 
who God really is in your life. We're going to have people that, that would love to pray for you. Don't be afraid right now to take that step of faith. Don't let maybe what other people's view of you is get in the way of God's view of you. Um, so I really appreciated this time. Um, I really want you to, to hopefully take away again. Um, Jesus is not a God that cares about what you have, what you don't have. He cares about you inside and out, not outside in. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to just close this in prayer. Um, God, I just thank you so much for this day. Jesus, I, I just pray, Lord, that we would not look to the things of this world. We would not look to the external things, but we would um, really dive into internally how do we uh, live out this faith, live out our lives with you. God, I, I trust and we trust in what you're doing always. Um, we know that, again, the testing of our faith produces so much more. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for who you are, for what you did um, on the cross. And God, again, I just pray that we would get right, that we wouldn't make it about everything externally, Lord, um, the physical, but we would make it about the spiritual, Lord. Fill us up, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.